Hello and welcome back to another episode of Political Agenda with me, your host, PJ Thumb. Uh, and today we have the second part of our interview with Terence Soon and Wendy Lowe of the Progress Singapore Party. As always, we desperately need your support for New Narrative. We are supported entirely by membership uh, and donations. So if you enjoy this interview and you enjoy the work that we do, please do join New Narrative at newnarrative.com slash join uh, or donate at newnarrative.com slash donate. Enjoy the show and here's Subash. Here we are again. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is PJ Thumb. I am with Terence Soon and Wendy Lowe, Progressing Our Party at the headquarters. Uh, I'm wearing a blue and white batik shirt sitting in front of a table and where behind us is the Progress Singapore Party uh, backdrop. So uh, Terence, if you can just quickly... Sure. Oh, and my pronouns are he, him. Just reintroduce uh, yourself and what you're wearing and then we can carry on with the interview. Of course. Hello, my name is Terence Soon. I'm currently the head of Youth Wing of the PSP and I'm currently wearing a red colour plaid shirt and uh, pronouns are he and him. And on to you, Wendy. Hi, my name is Wendy Lowe. I'm the current chairperson of the Women's Wing of Progressing Poor Party. I'm wearing a blue jacket shirt and sneakers to run to the office. <laughs> Thanks. Let, let me ask a question, um, I think, which is very sort of commonly addressed to um, opposition politicians, which is what difference can you actually make joining an opposition party uh, given that all the power in government is concentrated in the hands of the government as long as they have 50% of the seats plus one? Right, so even if you win 49% of the seats or 50% of the seats minus one, um, there is very little you can do beyond the sort of bully pulpit of uh, an MP's seat and the questions that you ask in Parliament. And you're not even there yet. Even the Workers' Party, they have just 10 seats. You have two nominated MPs. So what can an opposition party actually do or achieve or what would you like to see achieved um, in the next few years, bef- you know, between now and the election? I come from a fairly competitive environment, so I would say competition is always good, mm-hmm. uh, even if you're politics. Mm-hmm. Um, and where I see that being translated maybe from one or two examples from the ground that we've seen. So after election, um, me and some of my volunteers in the Tanjung Paga site, we've gone back to visit some of the residents in the one-room flats and the rental homes. And through our direct interaction, we realized that some of them actually do need a lot of resource support. Um, and there was a particular incident where I, I remembered that, you know, there was this very nice auntie who approached us at, at the gate and we spoke to her for a while. And after a while, she, we noticed that she has this very beautiful curtain that's sort of blocking the rest of the flat from the view. And so when she got a bit more comfortable, she shyly revealed that she actually didn't have any mattresses for herself and her sister. And so while it's good to engage residents in terms of policies and and the things that we want to do in the next five years, um, we realized that there was a direct need. So the cost of giving out um, furniture, especially mattresses, the incumbents saw what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I can't say that they have not been doing it before, but definitely, shortly after that incident and after I've shared about that incident online um, and the next time we went back to that same block we were told that all the residents in that block were offered free mattresses and pillows right. if they were to submit their particulars and go to an office to sign up. Right. So I think they are feeling the heat especially with the last election results. Um, we may or may not be able to break through that 50% barrier but I think they are definitely watchful of what we're doing and I think it's through consistent effort and doing outreaches and through direct engagements I've mentioned earlier, um, they feel that they will need to match up and alongside uh, and especially the younger voters looking closely at the MPs and what they are doing, they definitely need to be trying a lot more. So the other interesting thing I've seen on the social front is that there are a lot more singers from political parties 
we have mm-hmm. Chi Sun Chuan. We had a last uh, Christmas fundraising. I okay. noticed that Injani was doing a Christmas carol. Workers' Party started doing their own Christmas caroling. So I think it's that sense of healthy competition that got people to realize that uh, apart from serious political li- dialogues, there, there needs to be many other forms of outreach and because everyone's kind of observing what each other is doing. Right. Uh, a lot more ideas are being tested. Yeah. Right. Um, well, um, right. okay. I, I, if, if I may add, um, you know, you mentioning about the 50% in Parliament plus one, um, that the, the difference here is right now we don't even have 33% in Parliament, right, yeah. to, to deny PAP of the super majority. Because as long as they have two-thirds majority in Parliament, they can change the constitution pretty much at will. And, and with a party whip system in place, um, pretty much all the PP members would have to vote according to party lines. And of course, the, this party whip is a bit controversial because you know, even workers' party would have it, right? Yeah. Um, however, uh, the fact that it's there and the fact that PAP has the two-third majority, it means that if they want to make any more further changes to the presidential election, they can. I, I doubt they will, but they can, and they can pretty much do whatever, you know. I, I, th- there's boundless possibilities and what they can change. So these are things that we have to um, seriously consider. And right now, the good thing is, you know, the opposition parties, the alternative parties, have been calling for a live stream of parliament for the last donkey years. Yes. And finally, this year, we managed to have it. So that, that, I think, you know, is a step in the right direction, right? Of course, people can say it's a double-edged sword because, for example, if the opposition, they, they make a fool of themselves in parliament, they, you know, mm. they start talking nonsense and people just, you know, whack them. And it's not going to reflect well on the party. However, um, I, I believe that whoever uh, is in parliament, be it from the PP side or from any other party, they are of a certain caliber and from what I've seen they're more or less pretty good and you know it's from things like that right that um, now members of the public can really judge for themselves they can see for themselves uh, which parties are credible and which are not unfortunately if you're not in parliament yet for example if you know you're from the SDP or from reform party or wherever where you don't have representation in parliament it's a bit more difficult um, but yeah, um, it, it, it's all incremental steps, right? So like for us, we're just starting with two uh, NCMP and hopefully, of course, uh, as, as we go you know, further down the road, we can have more representation in parliament as a full MP. And yeah, you know, the members of public, they, they can definitely see that, okay, ho- hopefully the kind of... Uh, impression we're giving is these are people who have heart for the people these are people who have brains and can come up with you know decent policies that actually work so brains yeah. are important <laughs> I completely agree so it, it seems like this is the broad sort of uh, if I can characterize it consensus that the opposition's role in Singapore right now is really to pressure the PAP but there is no real hope that the opposition can form the government anytime soon barring you know, black swan events or, or some sort of um, the, a massive failure by the PAP. Uh, it's, it's chiefly about pressure at all the different points, grassroots, uh, in parliament, in, in the media, at the policy level, trying to hold the government accountable and trying to um, shed light on areas where the government might not look or might have forgotten about. Well, un- unfortunately, PJ, you know, like I, I've watched many of your videos which uh, you produce, I, I think even pre-GE or during GE itself, where mm-hmm. you mention, you know, the extreme unequalness of mm-hmm. how the PAP is in every part of the system. Yeah. Can we change that? I, I, I don't think with what we have right now, we can really change it. And, you know, even looking at Malaysia, right, where they had this change of government. Again, I'm no historian, you are, but from uh, the previous, previous election, when BN was still in power, um, they already didn't have the popular vote, right? There's a huge swing against them. So, 
and, and of course with the blackout they, they have eventually won it but the next election because of one MDB they, they lost it but they had uh, what close to half of the parliamentary seats we have 10 yeah. parliamentary seats out of 93 not, not including the NCMP seats so it, I, I don't see how we, s- we can suddenly say that oh we are ready to take over as the government because even if we have the right caliber of people which I, I mean you look at people in the WP the PSP can you find enough people to to form a cabinet I'm pretty sure you can yeah but can you find that many people uh, to contest every single seat because you know we, we've only sent one to uh, I, I, I don't know the exact number of candidates maybe 20 plus well I mean 24. I'm not I'm not enamored of a lot of the quality of PAP candidates in many of the seats mm. you know the the fact is there's there's only 30 how 30 what's the exact number it keeps changing every election and I forget uh, about 32 35 constituencies and so you have these ministers who uh, anchor the constituency yeah. and then you have three four five people uh, running with them who mm-hmm. you know you never hear of they what do they do what do they actually say believe in right you know and it's a joke i made in uh, one of my early videos can you actually name the people who run with Taman? no nobody cares who the other four people who run with Taman are you're voting for Taman, right mm-hmm. and and then the pap tried to sneak in ivan lim yeah. using that system um, and uh, you know however many what six seven months later there's still no accountability by Ivan Lim uh, but you know um, we're getting off topic um, but th- that's that's the point I think you don't actually it, it would be um, unfair to you to say all of your candidates have to be high caliber when the PAPs clearly are not high caliber mm-hmm. and there's a lot of people that enter parliament and then um, you know, barely ask questions or, or don't perform or don't raise significant issues or are just there to vote um, on behalf of the PAP. Yeah, but, but again, you yeah. have to have some sort of parliamentary experience. O- of course, there are many people who just, you know, in, in the PAP side who are first-time MPs. However, the bulk majority of them are still veterans, right? They, they, they've been in politics for a long time. And right now, if we only have... Uh, 12 people in parliament from the alternative parties 12 people with actual experience how are you going to suddenly take over government and, and, yeah, yeah. and, and run the parliament I, I don't see that no, ha- you're, you're making a fair to. point yeah. yeah you know it was just um, what I, I what's important to me is that you do seem to have a realistic understanding of where the party sits in Singapore right now and what you can achieve mm-hmm. right and um, and to you know, in that context, right? To, uh, you know, that's why I asked you, like, what do you think you can do over the next five years? Because um, I think it's very important that you have uh, a clear idea of the political economy of Singapore and what can be done. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to get demoralized, right? You know, sure. if you're an opposition politician in Singapore, mm-hmm. you have to accept that you may never win an election in your lifetime, but you have to mm-hmm. keep fighting. Sure. You know, and you want to keep hoping and you want to keep fighting and always live in hope. But you have to understand the change that you create doesn't come from winning elections. It mm-hmm. comes from simply existing and chipping away at this very monolithic government. Mm-hmm. What I was hoping to focus on in this part of the interview of you, Terence, is really about the youth wing. Sure. Um, and so first, maybe you could tell us about the youth wing and what it actually does in its relationship to the main party. Because it differs from party to party. You know, in some parties, youth wings are the younger members and they get together and they talk about more theoretical things. In other parties, it's more about outreach. In some parties, it's about grooming younger people to step up to leadership roles. So um, what is the youth wing in the Progressing Singapore Party? Well, I, I would say it's actually quite an amalgamation of everything that you've mentioned um, although not we, we are not like a, a feeder party to, to you know the main progressive party um, essentially our membership consists of people from 17 to 35 year olds mm-hmm. so um, like what you mentioned just now is it for just the younger people to join yeah you know when, when we first started just uh, late last year uh, post GE it was basically the membership is open to anybody just under the age of 35 so if if you're under 35 years old you'll just be kind of automatically put into the youth wing 
at the start, right? So what do we do here? Um, we, we actually, we want to provide a platform for uh, youth to be able to uh, raise the kind of issues that they are passionate about. And of course, um, looking at the future of the party, you know, the youths are ultimately the future of the party and the future of the country. So um, if, if you want to look at any potential leaders for, you know, uh, many years later, um, I, I think this is where you can really start to identify people because a leadership quality is kind of innate. You, you can't really, you know, I mean, you can train for it, but you, you can kind of see how this person's going to be like and kind of extrapolate, you know, into the future just by looking at how he is now. So, yeah. Right, I, I think, I, I would hope you can, or at least I think Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School of Government would argue that you can train leaders because that's their whole financial model, right? Well, well <laughs> that, that's arguable for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I ask, um, as I as I asked Wendy in the last um, interview, um, how were you, are, are you appointed or were you elected? I was appointed. Appointed also yes. to organize and start up the youth wing. Correct. Um, I I might be wrong, but uh, I think uh, what uh, party leadership was looking at is uh, w- you know when we first started the youth wing and, and the women's wing was to essentially have uh, a person who ran for elections. Um, you know, in, in last year's GE, uh, to you know, jumpstart the entire uh, wing, right? Mm-hmm. So, for the youth wing, unfortunately, there were only two people under the age of forty uh, who ran for the elections: myself and Sean Chu. And um, of course, Sean, he's still currently an undergraduate. He's in his final year in law school. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a bit tough for him to, you know, be here. Right. So you're not really making a convincing case for yourself by saying, sure. oh, I was the de facto choice, there was no one else. No, no. no. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say I'm the best person to, to run the youth wing, but um, I did wa- you know, propose to the party even before the GE, and in fact, maybe even as early as a couple of years back, that the PSP should look into having a youth wing because... Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, at a point of time, uh, you know, one, two years back, the party was primarily uh, made up of more senior people. Well, so I, I don't think you can say it, but I can say it since I'm not a party member. There is a popular perception of PSP of being a party of old, retired, well, that, Chinese that, men. That, yeah, that, that was you know, the past, though. That yeah. was the past. Yeah. So uh, are you saying it's changing now or going to change with the youth wing? Well, um. Post GE, especially, yeah. and, and during GE itself, we had quite a lot of signups. Not not only for uh, the younger people, meaning the youth wing, but of course for female members as well. So, you know, each of our, our wings itself has uh, more than a couple hundred members already, which I I think it's it's very good for start. Yeah, and it's probably bigger than what some of the other parties, the entire party uh, membership is made up of. Not. Well, we're not trying to break anything here, but it's it's just that you know when when you have a platform, and people believe in in the kind of ethos and the kind of values that that you espouse, then I think naturally they want to join, and and see how they can contribute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, how do you hope to create, uh, change, promote more youthful points of view within the party? What would you you know what what do you see the youth wing's role as? Um, is you know in 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 sort of trying to surface many of the issues that younger people care about, um, because th- there is, you know, people's issues change as they age, of right? Course. And new narratives, own citizens' agenda survey found a very uh, some very clear trends that the older you are uh, in Singapore, the more you're concerned about broader structural uh, sort of um, like um, healthcare, housing. Uh, the the PAP's destructive politics, transparency and accountability, right? So issues which are more specific to you uh, as you age, but also as you experience the system and all the problems with it. Whereas the younger you were, the more likely you talk about inequality, um, climate change, right? Uh, and and also the fundamental assumptions governing 
um, our society. So when I talk to younger activists, there's a common theme of, you know, capitalism isn't working, right? Um, and less of, oh, I want my CPF, right? So th- these are very different issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and how do you surface these issues? What do you ad- how do you bring these issues up within the party? Well, you're, you're not wrong, BJ. Um, however, you know, when, when you mentioned just now about things like housing, uh, health care, okay, well, we, the, the youth don't really have the same health problems as the elderly, but, but definitely health care is, is, is something they look at. If you look at cost of living, mm-hmm. um, it, it doesn't only affect the, the elderly, right? I, I mean, for myself now, I'm 30 years old, um, right? Uh, have a BTO come in and, and right, I've, I've a, I have a baby daughter. So actually many of the things that uh, the more senior people are concerned with, we are also concerned with just in a, in a different aspect of it. So um, if, if, if you're talking about things like uh, unfairness, that's something I, I believe many youths are very concerned about as well, right? Um, so uh, things like how in politics, the opposition in Singapore unfa- unfortunately is really always kind of quashed Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, th- things like that. We want to see more equality, more more um, change, structural change, in in the whole political system in Singapore. And and I believe that's ultimately why many people chose to join as well. Um, but when you're looking at uh, youth specific uh, issues, right? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that climate change is just something that the youths are concerned about mm-hmm. it, it's it's okay it's maybe something that they are a bit more outspoken but it doesn't mean that that uh, that the older folks are you know they don't care but um of course for the PSP itself uh, the youths are the ones actually uh, kind of taking the lead on more of um, you know, or, or, or this environmental protection kind of thing. So, for example, uh, the PSP Youth Wing, we have already done a, a, the West Coast Park cleanup. Next, we are going to Bishan Park um, at the end of this month. And, and of course, that would carry on. And things like recycling projects, even when it's run on the GRC level, uh, primarily it's the youths who are a bit more uh, passionate about it. And, and, and so they kind of take the lead to to organize this and that but uh, naturally you'll have people from from all other um, strata in the party who also join in all, all these kind of stuff so um, the kind of platform that we want to give the youths to to really um, voice out what they are concerned about one of the ways in which we do it for the youth wing is uh, we're actually ho- hosting and organizing a internal debate session Right, so the youths are able to come out. We'll, well, we intend to run it quarterly. We've already done a trial run of it. The, the next one will be end of Q1 of 2021. And of course, subsequently every quarter. Mm-hmm. And each debate session, we have uh, different motions to, to talk about. And uh, our NCMP, Manwai, has very graciously uh, you know, offered to, to be a part of it. Right, So we, we actually have our youths who, you know, if, if you feel you want to talk about something you can either debate directly against the parliamentarian himself or you know just put your point out and and you know just exchange ideas right in the internal environment we're, we're not going to like do a televised debate or something at this point of time but yeah um we we believe that it definitely serves as a sort of platform for for people to to raise things that they like that they are passionate about and that they have done research on because it, it's important you can't just talk about something without be, being able to substantiate with right. facts and figures yeah. right so so i i believe that's something which um, yeah we we hope can propagate into something uh bigger and better you know a year or two down the line okay yeah so internal debates and the ability to speak directly and put those ideas directly to one of your two parliamentarians right i see that that's that's a pretty powerful channel um but I- if i'm not wrong the the youth don't have reputa- a representation on the cec right is uh, that you don't have anyone under who's part of the youth wing who's also on the cec correct right well and um are there sort of formal channels 
like you would submit proposals, would you have to go through, say, would you surface proposals to and send them to the CEC? Or are there actually, do you plan more formalized channels where the, say, the, the leadership will be accountable to the youth wing, you know, at a, at a meeting once a, once a quarter or something has to come and, and, you know, do a sort of like a prime minister's questions type thing, right? Um, a Where? town hall. A yeah. town hall. Yeah. Right, right. Yes, a town hall to the youth wing. Would you? Uh, are some of those? We we, we have actually conducted a town hall already yeah. last year. I I can't remember which month. It could be October or September or November, and I can't mm-hmm. remember. But yeah, uh, Doctor Tan himself. I think Manwai Hazel. They were all part of it, and and they came down and Great. you know fielded questions from the youth themselves. Um, but. For what you're asking, in, in, in terms of uh, you know, directly feeding back things to, to the party senior lead leadership, there's no red tape that you really find in huge organizations out there. So if, if an, anybody wants to reach out directly to, to Manwai, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's more than happy to feel that, and likewise with Hazel. And um, so how we work with uh, the main party at large and also with, of course, our NCMPs is if they want to uh, get any um, kind of feedback from the youths about certain topics or they want to speak about some of it in parliament, well, we're, we're more than happy to support. For example, uh, Hazel recently, she she's doing some uh, uh, talk on IPS, right? And yeah, she I I pretty much just organized a, um, a, a session online uh, to you know, give her a, a chance to speak to some of our youth wing members to find out what they really felt about certain issues here and there. So yeah, um, it's quite um, easy to access them in, in a way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So historically, youth wings have been more, just because of the, you know, where you're coming from, in terms of timelines, youth wings have been more radical, more progressive, um, more desiring of fundamental change, um, partly because you know of whatever youthful outlook, but partly because you can look at the next seventy years. Whereas someone who's a retiree is not going to be thinking about seventy years in the future. You're thinking about ten, twenty years in the future. Right? Is this also? Do you also find this to be the case within the PSP that people are thinking? You know, you mentioned beach cleanups, and that's great. But then, are people also debating about the fundamental structure of our society, of our economy? You know, the the corrosive nature of late stage neoliberal capitalism, or applying those techniques to social organization. You know, these very fundamental forces, right? Nationalism, um, and the the sort of exclusion of certain um, people from being Singaporean. Right and the ideas of of uh, race that govern our society. You know, is this something that you have internal debates about? Well, not on every single thing that you've mentioned, but but for sure within our own um, you know youth wing group chat itself, it it is pretty lively. Um, many people have different you know their own different points of view and different aspects on how they view things, and um, yeah, they they do debate a lot. You know. Uh, virtually, um, which is why we want to provide them this debate platform for, for them to debate physically as well. Right. right. Um, I wouldn't say that uh, um, they are overly concerned with, you know, maybe capitalism or state welfare. Um, however, things like, should we have a minimum wage and, mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that? Right. Of, of, yeah. of course, uh, they know the parties stand and... Um, they can, of course, choose to take it or choose to have their own opinions. It doesn't really matter, right? We we welcome what whatever they they propose, and it's 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 just a a platform for us to be able to uh, gather the voices and collectively, you know, share it with the party and and allow them to, you know, make any tweaks as necessary in the kind of policies that they are pushing out in parliament or. Or on, on any other stage. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what is your agenda for your time in office? Your plan for the next, uh, you know, however many years until elections are held for your position? Right. Um, well, I, if I can borrow a term from flying, is that you know, uh, 
I do intend to be able to create a certain system and structure to ensure that the youth wing can pretty much run on autopilot. Right. Because, you know, without a proper system, without the a structure, um, at the time at which you hand over to whoever's going to take over you, because, you know, the youth wing, as I mentioned, the membership is kind of kept at 35 years old. I'll be 35 in a few years' time, right? So after that, I'll be no longer in the youth wing. So whoever's going to take over or if, you know, m- maybe a couple years down later, a uh, couple years down the line, if I if they elect someone else to be the head of youth wing, all well and good, right? This person has to be able to, you know, uh, adopt a system that has already been in place and, and make any tweaks as he sees fit. But, you know, for, for now, both the youth wing and women's wing, we are literally just starting out and trying to build something that, uh, people can really um, follow in the future. So, for for example, uh, in terms of the youth wing, we would definitely love to collaborate with any NGOs. Not all, but you know, uh, those that fit within the kind of scope that we're looking at, or, or NWOs or any any other type of association out there who is willing to to sit down and have a talk with us, be it formally or informally. Yeah. So th- this probably would be able to continue, right? Because once um, you've established a certain network network with them. Um, it, it's, it's just a matter of continuing it down the line. Yeah. And how about demographics? What is the current demographic makeup of the youth wing? Okay, uh, if if you're talking about age, like I mentioned, seventeen to thirty five. If uh, about gender, it's unfortunately still overwhelmingly guys. Right. Um, yeah. Sounds like you you two need to. Yeah, we're work on that problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when you say seventy thirty five, is it trending more to seventeen or more to thirty five? Um, I think the bulk of it is really about the mid twenties to late twenties. Okay. Yeah. Overwhelmingly men. Wh- why do you think that is? I, th- I would think that uh, well, well, it's hard for me to to give anything uh, qualitatively, right? But um, if I look at like my sister, my wife, they are generally not very much attuned to politics, they, they, they are not very interested. While many people like myself, my brother, my dad, you know, we, we do talk about it very often. I'm, I'm, I'm not mm. sure why, maybe it's just because we like reading newspapers. Uh, but but it, it, it's hard to say because yeah. Wendy here is definitely very much into politics. So My own experience with my family is the opposite. The, you know, so all the women are very uh, engage with politics and uh, in my my organization is overwhelmingly female and obviously new narrative is very is a very activist uh, right. organization um, so yeah I, I think maybe you, te- you two need to collaborate on recruiting more young oh, for women. sure we we'll, would we'll love to but what about race and actually this is for both of you like what is the the breakdown in terms of race or religion or language right these are classic dividing lines in singapore society which never have really been overcome we've never built a a national identity that's been able to really overcome the divisions um between the english speaking and the chinese speaking who live very different lives between Muslims, Christians and Buddhists who live very different lives, between Malays, Indians and Chinese who, you know, I think in, in, in that sense, class does overcome that a bit. Like, I think upper class uh, Malays, Indians uh, and Chinese have a lot in common. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, right, there are classic dividing lines in our society. How do you recruit um, people and interest people across those, those lines? Um, well, w- the the membership is pretty much open to to all. So whoever joins us would just be part of it. But um, you know, we we don't really look at social class or race or religion when when doing any sort of recruitment. Um, personally, I've never recruited anyone to my community just because they're of a certain race. No, it's it's all based on their own ability, uh, based on what we assess. So um. Right, but you know, we, we've had this discussion, right? Yeah. Your meritocracy in Singapore yeah. is, is is deeply flawed. Sure, uh, you know, it's very important to have diverse voices. So I, it's I it's not about j- deliberately, um, you know, we, we we put it this way: we talk about equality opportunity, right? Sure. So how do you ensure that uh, young Malay men and women, young Indian men and women, uh, or people who are not English speaking, or people who are of um, you know, different religious backgrounds 
have the opportunity to know about, to come to PSP events, join, make their voice heard, even though they will inevitably be surrounded by, um, you know, let's face it, straight male Chinese men will probably dominate. They dominate everything, right? It's the classic markers of elitism, of, of being elite in Singapore. Straight male Chinese, English speaking. And so how do you get those voices, those other voices out, you know, give equality opportunity to those voices? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, I, we haven't really had too many non-English speakers who, who even applied so far, but um, the, the closest thing I can think of is uh, we, we have members, youth wing members, who are very much into uh, dialect speaking. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they want to kind of revive this old tradition. And um, when, when he approached me, I, I told him, of course, I'll, I'll, de- I'll definitely... Uh, you know, try try to to push for this, be, be it whatever kind of event that we can run it, be it a talk show or, or an educational aspect or something. That, but you know, if, if if it's something that you're passionate about and it's something that you're willing to to lean on, I would definitely try to do what I can to uh, you know leverage on the party as a whole to bring about you know things like dialect speaking and sorry and and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, but. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how the women's wing really faces yeah, how would, stuff how do like you that. Uh, we're running out of time. So the last question, Wendy, how would you try to you know, recruit more non-straight, non-Chinese, non-English speaking women, you know, minority women, more minority women to the women's wing? I'm not sure about non-straight, but <laughs> um, I think for the first quarter or so we've done uh, outreaches during festivities so for example during Deepavali uh, one of our Indian women members actually initiated an idea of um, raising some funds to buy some necessities as well as sparklers and all that to reach out to families of lower income so and because of the nature of the, of the event I think there were more um, Indian members who stepped up to volunteer but Indirectly also, we saw uh, many other women as well as men from other branches who came along to support. So we, we had dialogues around what the festival meant for them as a community. Uh, so there was a very good exchange around that and, and there was a debrief over beer. So, um, and, and that kept a small community growing because then they realised that it, it was very validating. Um, and I remember there was one particular segment where we tried to shoot a small video of the event. So we are, we're spaced out and we're doing a mini dan- dance that the Indian woman member was trying to teach us. And along the way, a Chinese lady with what looked like a foreign spouse or boyfriend came along and she too joined in the dance. So it became very, um, I would say empowering for us to see that it, it can start with a very small event and a very small idea by one woman, but it can grow. And it's got the potential to reach out not only to the minority community, but also to Singaporeans who saw um, basically the outreach that we're trying to do, but also the fun that we're having as a grown woman. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, so th- thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time, but mm-hmm. I want to thank both of you um, for being so open and willing to come on this podcast and talk about um, all the challenges that you face, really. We, I think, as in general in the public, we don't realize how much work it takes growing a political party and organizing it. And, you know, all the stakeholders you have to, um, you know, please and, and whose uh, issues you need to take, it, concerns you need to take into account and all the work that you need to do and all on your, on your own time, right? Mm-hmm. No one's paid for this. So um, thank you so much for allowing us to peek behind the curtain and understand, you know, what you're trying to do. And, uh, you know, you said this is a, a very young party, new party, and um, you're just starting out on building a lot of these things. So um, I hope, I, I, you know, would love to be able to check back with, in with you in, say, two years' time and see what you've, you've done, what you've accomplished and what you've built. And, and, uh, and yeah, I, th- I think um, we all wish you all the best. Singapore definitely needs more diverse viewpoints. And, uh, you know, if you succeed, uh, if all the opposition parties grow and become very... 
uh, well run and, and have a lot of diverse ideas and thoughts, you know, it can only be good for Singapore. So I w- wish course. you all the best. So thank you very much, Wendy, for, for coming on the show. Thank you, Terence. Thank, um, you, thank you, PJ. And thank of course, thanks for having us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you to you, our audience, for listening, for watching. Um, as always, if you've enjoyed what you've heard, if you um, you know find it useful, helpful, please do join New Narrative as a member. We rely very much on memberships. Um, entirely membership uh, funded and with donations so if you'd like to join go to newnarrative.com slash join and if you'd like to donate please go to newnarrative.com slash donate so thank you very much and see you next time